Bruchem Aboim. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. <clears throat> Tonight's uh, class on uh, my thoughts, again, will be laughter in Judaism. Today will be a little bit different. We've added a Zoom to the uh, class that I give here at this lecture. Um, at the end of the uh, my thoughts, there'll be a I'll give it, there'll be a ten minute period if anybody wants to ask any question on Zoom. Uh, please do so. Anybody that's not on Zoom that would like to get on Zoom again, the information is here as well. So uh, we're going to try this and see how this works for a while, and uh, hopefully it'll be uh, interesting for everyone. So let's begin. So laughter in Judaism. We find ourselves in a time and space where we really could use some laughter. But how does Judaism view laughter? Our perception, our perception of religion in general seems to be very stiff and regimented. A levity is looked upon with disdain. So is there any place in Orthodox Judaism for laughter? So let us look back in our history and see if the past answers our question. Now the first child born as a Jew was Yitzchok, the son of born to Sarah and Avram in their old age. And he was the first male child circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. They named him, at his bris, at his circumcision, Yitzchok, which comes from the Hebrew word litzchok, meaning to laugh. As Sarah said in the portion of Ayira 21.6, that it says there that tzachok asa lielukem, that God has made me for laughter, kol hashomea yitzachik li, that anyone who will hear about it will laugh for me. It does seem just a little bit strange that the one patriarch who's known as the paradigm of severity, toughness, <laughs> would be named Yitzchak. Laughter alluding to laughter. Again, in the portion of Toldos, it says that Yitzchak metzachik es rifka ishto. The Yitzchak was metzachik, enjoying himself, joking around with his wife Rivka. So I believe the Torah is telling us that taking the correct path in life consists of following that which God has directed us in his Torah. However, taking life and our responsibilities seriously doesn't negate laughter. Strangely enough, it may actually allow for a deeper and more appreciative form of joy. Interestingly enough, if, if you take the name Yitzchak, it can actually be broken up into two words. They are Kate's Chai, which translates to mean the end of life. There's a saying that he who laughs last, laughs best which the world, when the world finally reaches its final destination with the coming of Mashiach, with the Messiah, then we will all be able to truly laugh and be joyous with the applause and the approval of the whole world. This will occur due to the efforts of Yitzchak, our father, whom the Talmud in Shabbos calls the true patriarch of the Jewish nation. We find in, in the Code of Jewish Laws, the Orachayim 560, that stated in the Talmud, also in Brachos, in the name of Shem Bar Yechoi. It says there that it is forbidden for a person to fill his mouth with laughter in this world. So it would seem that laughter has really no place in Judaism. Now, according to some authorities, this prohibition existed only after the destruction of the Temple. Others say that there was a concern that unrestrained frivolity may lead one to be drawn after worldly pleasures and the ultimate neglect of Torah and mitzvahs. There's a story told of Reb David Furkus. He was a chassid of the Holy Baal Shem Tov. And there was a certain misnagid, again a term used for those who oppose the approach of the Holy Baal Shem Tov and Hasidus, who questioned him. He wanted to know how it was possible that Hasidim would fabreng. Now that's a term used to describe a coming together of Hasidic individuals, where they would sing and dance, tell stories, and give over words of Torah that they had heard from their leaders, feeding off of each other, a form of group therapy. This misnag had said to Rav Furkus, don't you know that we are in exile and our temple has been destroyed? How can you forbring? Rav Furkus said to him that we read in the Torah in the book of Numbers at the end of chapter 5 in the portion of Nusso about the laws of a sota. Now, the term sota was a name given to a woman who was accused by her husband of infidelity. The court would bring both her and her husband 
to the temple in Jerusalem, where they would be tested by the bitter waters. This was a ritual performed by a Kohen, by a priest. By drinking the water, it would test the purity of the woman who was accused by her husband of being unfaithful. Now, she could admit her guilt at any time and not drink. She would then be divorced. If she did drink and she was guilty, then she and her lover would both die a terrible death. However, if she was innocent, then God would bless her with the birth of a very special child. Immediately after the laws of the Soto in chapter 6, we are taught the laws of the Nazar. And now a Nazar is someone, male or female, who has taken upon themselves a higher form of service to God. This is done by them accepting upon themselves certain restrictions, such as <clears throat> not cutting their hair, not drinking wine, and not having any contact with the dead. These restrictions would be enforced for a period of not less than 30 days. The person involved would then be referred to as a Nazar. Now, Rashi there tells us that the reason these two themes, the Sota and the Nazar, are next to each other is to tell us that if someone sees a Sota in her state of degradation, they should become a Nazar. Yet Rashi states nine verses later that when the Nazar has completed their term of obligation, they are required to bring a sin offering. Now the question becomes, but why? What sin could they have committed? After all, they have accepted upon themselves a higher service of God. So Rachi answers the question, because they refrain from drinking wine. So then Rafurkas turned to the Misnagin and asked them. It, it, it seems strange. First, Rashi tells the individual to become a Nazar and abstain from wine. And then nine verses later, Rashi says they should bring a sin offering from, for the fact that they abstain from wine. So, really, how are we to understand these two seemingly conflicting statements? So, Reb Furka said to the Misnagin, we have a precept found in the Talmud in the Sanhedrin. Reb Chia said, Nichnas yayin yotzasod, that when wine enters, all the secrets come out. So, Reb Furka said that the physical property of wine is that it intensifies whatever you're feeling. And based on that fact, if you see the glass is half empty, if you see this world in a negative fashion, then you should not drink wine. However, if you see the glass is half full, if you see the world in a positive fashion, then your abstaining from wine is a sin, and you need to bring a sin offering. Now, the Talmud in Titus tells the story of Reb Rocha, who was in the marketplace with Eliyahu and Navi, Elijah the prophet. He asked Elijah, who in this marketplace has a share in the world to come? Elisha pointed at two individuals and said that they both had a share in the world to come. Rebrachi was surprised. Uh, these two individuals certainly didn't look overly pious or spiritual. In fact, just the opposite. So he went over to them and asked them, What is your occupation? And they answered, We are jesters. We cheer up those people who are depressed. We make them smile. When we see two people who have been arguing, we try to make peace between them. We try to make, make them laugh. Bringing joy and laughter to others makes you a better and happier person. And as a bonus, it is a guaranteed ticket to a share in life in the world to come. You know, Victor E. Frankel was a noted author and Holocaust survivor. He wrote that happiness is a door that opens outward. The Talmud in Makos tells the story of Rabbi Akiva and the sages. They were coming up to Jerusalem after the destruction of the temple. And when they came to the Temple Mount, they saw a fox emerging from the place where the Holy of Holies used to stand, the most sacred place on earth. They began to cry. Rabbi Akiva began to laugh. They said to him, Akiva, why are you laughing? He asked them, well, why are you crying? They said to him, a place upon which it is written that the non coin who came, comes close shall be put to death and now foxes are walking around there shouldn't we weep he said to them for this very same reason I am laughing he told them the two prophets Uriah the Kohen and Zechariah ben Yevirah were both prophets 
Uriah prophesied during the era of the first temple, whereas Zechariah prophesied during the set period of the second temple. The prophecy of Zechariah was dependent on the prophecy of Uriah. The prophecy of Uriah stated that, therefore, because of you, Sion, Zion, will be plowed over like a field. And the prophecy of Zechariah stated, old men and old women will yet still sit in the streets of Jerusalem. Rabbi Kiva said to his companions, as long as the prophecy of Uriah had not been fulfilled, I had feared that the prophecy of Zechariah would not be fulfilled either. Now that I see the prophecy of Uriah has been fulfilled, it is then obvious that the prophecy of Zechariah will also be fulfilled. So we see that in the worst of situations, Rabbi Akiva was able to laugh. So too today. Though the world seems to be in total turmoil, we need to know that this was exactly what the prophets told us would happen, occur during the time in history before the coming of the Messiah. Based on their prophecies, we, just like Rabbi Akiva, need to laugh. When we say the first six words in the Shema Yisrael, Hear, O Israel, we state our allegiance and total belief in the one and only God. The last letter in both the first and the last words of, in this declaration have an enlarged letter. The ayin at the end of the first Hebrew word Shema, here, and the dalad at the end of the last Hebrew word, Echad, one. Together they spell two Hebrew words, aid, a witness or testimony, and if you turn it the other way, and da, no, knowledge. We know and testify that the Lord is our God and that he is one. The remaining four letters of these two words spell the Hebrew word esmach, which means I will be happy. The only true happiness in this world is when we connect to God Almighty, our Father in heaven, and his Torah. That's something to truly laugh and be happy about. Now, one of the major precepts of the holidays is simcha, joy. As stated in the portion of Riyeh, the verse states, V'samachta b'chagecha, and you shall rejoice in your festivals. Joy is actually a mitzvah, a Torah commandment. So, too, we read in Tehillim, in Psalm 100, Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha, serve God with joy. The Holy Baal Shem Tov said that more than the side of evil wants you to sin, it wants you to be unhappy. If you are unhappy, <laughs> then sinning is inevitability. It states in the Talmud that the Tana Rabba would begin his lectures with a joke. He did so to get the attention of his students and to put them in the right frame of mind so that they could listen and concentrate when he gave his lecture. The power of joy and laughter, there is a Hasidic saying, Simcha Paritz Geder, that joy breaks down fences. You know, I once saw a video on YouTube where a man was on a crowded subway car in New York City. He was talking on his cell phone. He began to laugh. Well, people stared at him, but they really went about their own business. But he continued to laugh. <laughs> Deep belly laughter. And somehow, even though people tried to control themselves, everyone, everyone on the subway car was laughing. They just couldn't help themselves. They didn't even know what the stranger was laughing about. It, it really didn't matter. <laughs> it is a fact. Laughter is infectious. But think of a different scenario where someone is crying on a subway car, sobbing. There is no way that the whole subway car is going to break out in tears. Sure, there would be those sensitive individuals who would feel bad, maybe even go over and try to comfort the person. But there's no way that everyone would join in and start to cry. If anything, many people would find it annoying and distracting. So laughter is contagious. It makes us all happy. Sometimes people even cry tears of joy. I find it interesting that people who are happy can even turn tears into an expression of joy, a positive. When people are unhappy, in a state of misery, well, guess what? They never feel a desire to break out into laughter. Misery is too selfish to share itself with anything else. The Jews in the desert were punished by God because they cried in their tents. 
I think that just maybe we have the ability to change the negativity in our world today by all of us joining together and bringing joy and laughter into our hearts and into our homes. We see that in the time of Achav, who was a, an evil king who reigned over the kingdom of Yisrael. He was an idol worshiper, and yet, when his troops went to battle, no one died. The reason given was because the people got along with each other. There was joy and laughter in Israel. God, much like a loving father, is reluctant to punish his children when they are in a state of happiness. However, when there is division and animosity among them, ah, then he allows the forces of retribution to reign. In the portion of Kiselva, we read about the 98 curses, the Tokacha, that Moshe warns the people will be their punishment if they rebel against God in his Torah. In verse 2847, it tells them the main reason that God will bring his retribution about, upon them. It says there, Taka Sasher Lo Avadata, Es Hashem Elokecha Basimcha Vatuv Merov Kol, which translates to mean, since you didn't serve the Lord your God with happiness, and a glad heart when you had plenty of everything. The main reason for God's anger against them will be because of their ingratitude and their lack of joy. So we see the power of joy can even protect us from divine retribution. When you stop and count just how, many, just how much joy there is connected to being an, a religious, an orthodox Jew, it's amazing. There are a total of 70 days in the year where we celebrate holidays and Shabbos. Now, even though we pray longer on the Shabbat and the holidays, still, there is plenty of time for eating, sleeping, and socializing with friends and family. You know, during the week, I barely have enough time to eat my meals. It seems like they are all rushed. My wife has to remind me to chew. However, on the Shabbat and on the holidays, many times I will spend two to three hours sharing my meals with family and friends. We tell stories, sing songs, schmooze, have a l'chaim. We laugh and share our joy together. Then there are so many special events that we celebrate. Circumcisions, baby namings, redemption of the firstborn son, the upshearing, the first haircut given to a three-year-old boy. All the parties associated with marriage, including what we call the Sheva Brachas, the seven days that we entertain the newlyweds. There are birthdays, anniversaries for our bringings, Hasidic gatherings, Yorzeit. The list goes on and on. And of course, I didn't mention that many of us also take advantage of all the secular holidays as well, where we take off of work and can enjoy ourselves. So not only are we allowed and even commanded to be happy, we are even instructed as how to achieve the state of true and total happiness. It states in Pirkei Avos, the Essex of the Father, in chapter 4 of the first Mishnah, Ben Zoma said, Ezeha Osher, who's a rich person? Hasomeach Bechelko. And he answers, one who is happy with what he has. Now the wording in Hebrew is very, very precise, and it's telling us an important fact. The Hebrew words, Sameach, happy, is in the present tense. It is telling us an important message that the only way to be truly happy is to stay in the moment. If someone were to give you a great deal of money, it would probably make you pretty happy. Before you receive the money, you may not have been happy, and after you did receive the money, you may well think that you really could have gotten even more money. But in the present moment, yeah, you are truly happy. Our sages are telling us that the only way to achieve and retain true happiness it's to stay in the moment, in the present. As the saying goes, the past is history, the future is a mystery, and all we have is the present, and that's why it is called the present. We also see the word ashray, happy is, used many, many times in our prayers. To Helim, the book of Psalms begins with the word ashray ha'ish, happy is the man. Psalm 145, a prayer we recite three times daily, begins with the words, ashray yoshre vesecha, Happy is the man who dwells in your house. We also recite daily in our prayers the words, Ashri Ish, Asher Yishmael the Mitzvah Sarascha Udvorcha Yosem Alibo. Happy is the man who follows your commandments and your Torah and your words he places on his heart. 
True and complete happiness can only be realized when one connects themselves to the source of all happiness, our Father in Heaven. You know, there's a verse in the portion of Achab, again, which we'll be reading this week, which states, When and if you forget Hashem your God, and the verse ends with the words, And the end result will be that you will serve other gods. Rabbi Yisrael of Rishon, the Rishoner, interprets this verse a little differently. He said the only way to serve God is with joy and true spiritual simcha. The Hebrew word vahoya always alludes to joy. So he interprets this verse to tell us that if one forgets to serve God with joy, then the end result will be that eventually he will turn away from God and pursue other interests. He contends that joy and happiness are part and parcel of our service of God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. So, for one to think that Orthodox Judaism is dull, boring, without much joy and laughter, well, think again. Joy in life is not only recommended in Orthodox Judaism, it is obligatory. So let us thank God for all the joy that He bestows upon us, and let us rejoice with Him, with the truest joy of all, with the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly and in our time. And with that, we've finished the lecture. Again, if there are any questions that anybody has, um, mute yourself and please ask. And uh, if there are no questions, then we will go on to the second part of the lecture. So I will assume there are no questions. Again, um, please feel free in future lectures to do so. And I want to thank you again for uh, tuning in, for watching. And again, may God bless you and your family with all that is good, safety, happiness, and uh, Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Again, thank you for listening.